Awesome. Right, so um, thank you very much. And um, I, I should say that, that I'm very pleased to be presenting in this conference today. Um, let me introduce myself first. So my name is Carolina. I am a PhD candidate at the University of Auckland, New Zealand. Um, my research looks at the emergence of the TPNW through uh, feminist post-structuralist lenses. But today I'm going to be presenting a paper uh, that I've been working on for the last couple of months, and um, it looks at the NPT disarmament principle. So let me uh, begin with the story behind what kind of led me to actually write about the NPT disarmament principle. So um, here I'm engaging with a question um, on why nuclear weapons remain a persistent feature of global politics. And although there isn't a, like a single answer to this, I believe that um, this paper kind of offers a really interesting perspective and a really interesting dynamic to uh, help us understand why. I can't hear you very well, Carolina. Sorry, could you, if you can up your volume. I know it's the joys of Zoom. I'm sorry to interrupt you. No, no worries yet. Let me just try without this if it's, let's see if it helps. Is um, it better? That's, that's better. You sound a bit, you're, it breaks up slightly, but you sound louder, which is great, which is lovely. Thank you. And there's a note from Paul. Could you give me access to my audio and video controls? Yeah, I've done that, Trish, it's okay. Oh, lovely, okay, lovely. Okay, I'm sorry to interrupt you, Caroline, I'm sorry. No, that's all right, it's good, but uh, no, I think it's, I guess that people hear me well. So can you hear me well now, or should I adjust anything? You can. It does good. drop out, in, it does drop out in and out a bit, but maybe just, yeah, keep near to the mic, maybe. I'm not very good at these things mm -hmm. myself, but. I'll try and go a little closer here. Let me see. always a challenge with zoom and with with technology yeah. okay let me try a little bit if you can't hear well just interrupt me again and i'll try and fix things um right so i'm a little closer to the mic now so it should work now so i was saying um it uh, i think it, it really provides an interesting story about the disarmament principle so uh one thing that got me thinking about this uh was the uk's announcement that it would be increasing the number of warheads by 40 percent and in that um in that announcement the document the policy document and announces that I think it's a difference of two pages uh, that the UK reiterates its um, commitment to the disarmament principle. So I remember reading the report and talking to a friend of mine here at the Auckland Union. I was like, isn't it interesting that the UK is doing the wrong thing, but then it reiterates the disarmament principle and reiterates its commitment to disarmament. And then my friend said to me, well, there's nothing extraordinary about it. It's just what the NP NPT tells them um, the, that's the right, that's the thing to do. They possess nuclear weapons and they should commit to disarmament. Um, and I remember saying, well, maybe that's the problem. We've taken it for, for granted. So that's how it started. Um, and the idea here is really pause to reflect on whether the disarmament principle is really helping us uh, in, in achieving disarmament. Um, so let me, um, let me tell you what the argument is here. So the argument is that the NPT disarmament principle is affected by the politics that produced it. Um, so basically the disarmament narrative rather than helping us renders nuclear possession acceptable, upholding the nuclear status quo. So I draw attention to how the NPT provides nuclear states with the norms that can be used to produce less violent and more responsible possessors. So revealing a story in which the disarmament principle makes possible the very thing it is supposed to prevent. Um, so hi, how do I support all of this? Um, I turn to the work of Kimberly Hutchings and Maya Zafis. Um, so basically we work in their arguments uh, into the context of nuclear politics. 
And by doing that, I seek to contribute to the conversation on what sustains and the status quo. So here is a little bit of um, their work. So Hutchins, uh, she provides a feminist analysis of ethics and she draws attention to how uh, gender can be used in producing the kind of ethical subjects and um, also can be used to legitimize violence. So the analysis, for example, of war and how the US becomes a responsible and ethical actor um, at war, uh, for example, the war of Afghanistan, uh, talking about saving women um, and still engaging in war. So kind of legitimizing violence and making violence more acceptable. Um, and I find it interesting that Hutchins talks about how for you to legitimize something is not about the rational argument itself, it's about putting the conditions in place for the argument to be accepted as, um, as, 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 as rational, to be understood as rational. Um, Maya Zafis uh, talks about the ethics of war and she places some critical eyes on uh, the practice of war itself. Um, and what I find really interesting about her argument is that she talks about the laws of war as making possible the very thing um, it is supposed to prevent. So um, kind of drawing a parallel here with the disarmament principle, I find interesting how these ideas connect. Um, in her analysis of the civilian immunity principle, for example, she talks about how um, if conditions are met, for example, if killing is, un is unintended, then it justified. Uh, it's just a side effect of, permissible, of, of, of war and uh, permissible military action. So again, what, what is interesting here for me is that rather than being a solution, the laws of war for Zephyrs um, actually become the problem. And I find interesting as well um, when she talks about um, how the declarations of strict observance of the civilian immunity principle by Western states coincide with the um, with significant numbers of civilian deaths so it, at, at war. And for me, it's quite similar to what uh, what happens in nuclear politics. So we have all of all, like the the P five talking about your commitment to disarmament, but at the same time you have the P5 still possessing their weapons, increasing numbers, um, modernizing their arsenals. Um, right, so uh, that's the theoretical framework. Um, here is how I plan to develop the argument. So firstly, um, I will talk about the social expectations um, established by the NPT and how these social, social expectations are grounded in responsibility. So it's not only about possessing nuclear weapons, but possessing nuclear weapons responsibly. And I analyze the case of the United Kingdom and uh, look at policy documents, statements dating from 2010. And I look at how in the statements, the United Kingdom um, justifies possession by using references to the NPT and particularly the disarmament principle. So just to find possession um, kind of reiterating that responsibility using Article 6, uh, Article 6 uh, the disarmament principle of the NPT. In the second part, I return to my theoretical framework to Zafus and Hutchings and, and I develop the arguments a bit further, kind of connecting the case study with the idea, for example, Hutchings talks about uh, gender and how these narratives legitimize violence. So I talk about the disarmament narrative carrying meanings linked to nonviolence, responsibility, peace. So masking the violence, which is the act of possessing nuclear bombs. Uh, so basically, the disarmament narrative, the disarmament principle is reiterating that responsibility and getting us into this cycle of reiteration, producing 
dominant understandings, uh, which are the normal, the normal conduct in nuclear politics. So, and so long we continue to reiterate this uh, normal understandings, dominant understandings, we probably um, will continue there where things won't, won't change much. Um, so um, another thing I, I draw attention to and here drawing on, uh, on Zafers is how the civilian immunity norm for Zafers allows eth ethical differentiation. Um, and I kind of draw a parallel to the disarmament principle and how it helps to differentiate the nuclear possessors there in this scenario of nuclear politics. So making them conform to the established terms of intelligibility. Uh, for an acceptable possessor. Right, so some conclusions here, um, and probably I think the most important, I don't know how long I've been uh, going with this, but probably um, nearly 15 minutes. So I just wanna draw attention to my third point and probably leave the other two for the Q&A part. Um, just uh, in terms of achieving nuclear disarmament, I think it's really, really important that we try to understand nuclear, nuclear order and the status quo as like as much as we can. And I don't think we fully understand it yet. With, we, it's important and, and only by doing so, um, we'll be able to grasp and seize possibilities for change. Um, yeah, so I'll finish here and um, I'm looking forward to the discussion. I hope you could hear me well. But, um, thanks for listening. <clears throat> thanks, thanks, Carolina. Okay, um, Abhishek. Um... Are you there, Abhishek? Directly conflicting. I don't think we can hear you, Abhishek. We can see your slides, but we can't hear you. Yeah, we can hear you now. Audible? Yes. Is my presentation visible? It is, it is. It is, okay, thank you. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Abhishek. Uh, I've just completed my master's from South Asian University in New Delhi. And right now I'm involved in my research on engendering nuclear disarmament negotiations but I'm also following on uh, how gender intersect with the domain of cybersecurity and how it helps in uh, kind of uh, increasing the deterrence and how states look at that and how gender can play an important role in kind of uh, limiting the idea of deterrence, which is seen as in traditional lens. So, uh, uh, so uh, uh, as, as sure. so uh, my the topic uh, basically deals with uh, where do we locate uh, the the gender element when we talk about the uh, nuclear disarmament negotiations and uh, I, I share my concerns with the previous speaker which she also talked about how um, when we found when we see the kind of discourse in international politics uh, around the nuclear weapons it becomes very important to kind of talk about where do we where do we look at gender and where, was, where do we see gender when we talk about uh, disarmament negotiations so why is engendering of nuclear disarmament important so in 2020 nuclear arm, uh, armed states spent around 2072.6 billion dollars on their nuclear arsenals all nuclear armed states uh, have qualitatively tried to expand their nuclear arsenals and particularly six uh, nuclear armed states uh, china india north korea Pakistan, Russia, and UK are increasing the size of this stockpile. And this is, uh, 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 this is seen as a clear violation of the uh, NPT Article 6, which Clay talks about pursue, uh, to pursue disarmament for state parties. And this brings about that how the states uh, still looks at the idea of nuclear disarmament as something which, uh, as, as something which is used as conventional war and contemporary times uh, against not, they've used this idea of uh, deterrence in both conventional wars and non-conventional wars too. So, uh, and so this mentality of the states is basically shaped by the masculine perspective of national security, which looks at the complete annihilation of the other as a sign of victory 
an instrument used here for deterrence is nuclear weapons. And in contemporary times, where nuclear disarmament negotiations have been going on for decades and not progressing much, there has been a call for a more diverse engagement in negotiation on nuclear disarmament through various means. And nuclear disarmament is only one part of it, which is still considered uh, as a gender blind domain, where women's entry has been restricted and limited by a state security perspective dominates. But with increasing call for inclusion and gender representation in the negotiation on specialist security matters, the process has seen a little improvement. So when we talk about uh, locating gender, we should first talk about why gender is very important or vital uh, in nuclear disarmament negotiations. So as we all know, women and girls are affected differently by conflict and weapons. Women, men, boys and girls are affected differently uh, when we talk about conflict of weapons because of their lived experience and standpoint. Therefore, incorporating gender perspective into all disarmament policies, processes, and analysis become very crucial. Inclusivity and diversity uh, in negotiation process has been the hallmark of effective decision making in negotiation processes. And both these points brings out the best results and help in a comprehensive analysis of issues. And we have seen this again and again in many of the uh, treaties which have been signed. Uh, including the uh, ban of landmines. And the third part is the gender perspective highlights asymmetry in power structure. So gender perspective uh, uh, on weapons of mass destruction draw attention to issues of power inequalities, cultural expectations, division of labor and family reproduction, as well as biological differences. And the fourth one, which is uh, very important to highlight here, is that it has been scientifically proven that ionizing radiations affect with more harmful health risks to women than men because of 50% more high risk body tissues such as sensitive reproductive and fatty tissues as well as metabolic differences. So gender becomes a, a very important factor when we talk about nuclear weapons because women's experiences both uh, when we talk about nuclear security try to highlight the issues of feminine values and also uh, their own uh, perspective on how they deal with uh, weapons of mass destruction In my study, I've tried to uh, explain what do I mean by nuclear disarmament here and what, what, do, what do I mean by gender and what it encompasses. So here the nuclear disarmament uh, as traditionally seen as is the reduction or complete elimination of a state nuclear weapon, either by unilateral, bilateral and multilateral commitments by legal treaties. Nuclear disarmament normatively is about the abolition of nuclear weapons, which is also about halting, proliferation, stockpiling and also upgrading of nuclear weapons. But here I tr have tried to uh, kind of broaden the idea of gender. Uh, so as we see that gender means only what is feminine or what is feminine. But here, uh, as I said before, the idea of gender is by bringing in other aspect of like norms, agencies, normative beliefs, which are often kind of uh, kept at periphery when in the discourse of nuclear disarmament. And gender here is about the structured political, cultural power hierarchies that are embedded in practices of disarmament negotiations, like the dominance of one discourse of deterrence as a way to national security, or about the power structures in disarmament regimes that renders non-nuclear weapon states, particularly opinions as void. Gender here touches upon a spectrum of macro issues, both like structures of masculinity, power asymmetry with great powers, post-colonial mindset to micro-narratives of norms, representation, diversity, behavior, and importance of actors such as INGOs and civil society. A nuclear disarmament, uh, I, in my study, I've tried to locate uh, uh, gender in, in nuclear disarmament negotiation basically in two levels. First is the traditional forum where we see the state dealing with each other and kind of form, kind of deciding on what, uh, what are the, how do, how do they go on to dealing with issues of nuclear disarmament uh, negotiations. And we see, uh, we locate these particular in the first committee, which deals with the uh, issues of disarmament and international security issues, uh, multilateral forums, bilateral treaties, uh, and particularly with diplomacy, which is the uh, institutional form of uh, negotiation. But also in non-traditional forms, which have been gaining traction more and more with civil society movements, which are working very closely with uh, non-state actor, uh, with state actors, um, for example, the cam campaign against nuclear weapon abolition, and also women peace activism, which have tried, which have been trying to mainstream the uh, feminist values uh, into the theoretical and diplomacy of uh, international negotiations. 
and why non traditional forums becomes more important here is as we saw that uh, the most of the nuclear disarmament negotiation discourse have been dominated by p5 countries plus four uh, which are not signed uh, npt these countries have dominated the discourse and they have tried to control the discourse around the nuclear disarmament negotiation so non traditional forums gives both civil society and uh, uh, and uh, to kind of mainstream the idea of humanitarian perspective in working with states uh, which are non nuclear weapon states uh so when we talk about diplomacy one area which have been uh, which have which, which have seen a, a lot of progress is uh, the following of feminist foreign policy so as so as i said that a feminist foreign policy is basically deals about the mainstreaming of gender equality in processes and negotiations on multilateral forums so it basically highlights the importance of uh, women's perspective their experiences lived experiences and how women faces uh, conflict and nuclear Uh, and uh, weapons for mass destruction differently. How they see them differently. So feminist foreign policy try to mainstream this perspective in international nego negotiations, uh, be it in UN, UN Security Council or uh, or non-traditional forums such as first committees. So um, as we see, the increasingly uh, new countries have been uh, following in feminist foreign policy and trying to mainstream this uh, perspective. Um, and what what helps feminist foreign policy to Uh, to kind of mainstream this perspective, as it is based upon the uh, in consonance with UN Security Council Resolution One Three Two Five, which acknowledges that women's roles uh, uh, in areas of peace building and to create sustainable peace is as much important uh, in the current uh, geopolitical environment where uh, the discourse is very much uh, masculine, and it tries to broaden the aspect of national security, and particularly focus on the idea of representation and norm. And the one example which I'd like to uh, put here is the uh, example of GCPOAD, uh, which happened with Iran, where women representatives were involved. And after many years of failed negotiations and decades of enmity, the Republic of Iran and a group of countries formed by the United States, uh, which is P5 uh, plus Germany, reached a historic deal to curb nuclear uh, weapons of Iran. And one important feature of that deal, which is often kind of not highlighted so much, is Uh, the prominent leadership of three women: Frederica Mogherini, Helga Schmidt of European side, uh, and both of European side, and Wendy Sherman for United States. They, these women build on the previous work of another woman, Catherine Ashton, the EU chief diplomat until late 2014. And but here the case was, uh, uh, but also to point out uh, also about here was it was a case of representation and less of agency. Here the. Uh, Uh, the the women were seen as more of a good negotiator, getting a good deal out, uh, uh, getting a good deal uh, out of uh, uh, with Iran, rather than have a priority of, and also have a good high priority of success rate, uh, and rather than for following on what, what should be uh, the basic core of nuclear weapons, that is abolition. Uh, to quote, uh, I have to put uh, to put this uh, uh, graph uh, on your side that. We, this graph points out uh, that how in all four uh, uh, major forums, that is the first committee, the NPT PrepCom, TPNW, and also in conference of dis uh, disarmament, we can see the blue uh, blue color shows the presence of men, and the green color shows the presence of women representation. And we can see that in all four forums, uh, men representation has been more than sixty percent, and women representation has been uh, less than thirty four percent. so just this shows how skewed the representation of women has been in important forums on nuclear disarmament and why it becomes more important to see and to analyze uh, where does uh, gender uh, gender kind of highlights itself in uh, discourse of nuclear disarmament uh, 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 i would also quote one data from unida report uh, which talked about the analysis of gender balance of eight npt meetings from 1999 to 2015 Which showcased that every average proportion of women participation was 20.95%, and uh, and the first committee, uh, which deals with issues of nuclear disarmament and international security, uh, attracted the lowest percentage of women representation, as opposed to third committee, which deals with idea of uh, which deals with domains of humanitarian perspective. So in 2018, 10 of 168 delegation to the first committee were made up of just one diplomat. Of these 10 individuals. Eight were men and two were women, and this constitute a women percentage of 20 percent. 
Another 37 delegations were made up of just two diplomats. Of these, nearly half, 18, were all male and five were all female. The rest, 14, was split evenly, producing an average proportion of women in two percent delegation of 32 percent. Also pointing, uh, also uh, talking about the another forum, which is NPT PrepCon. In 2018, seven delegations were made up of just one diplomat. Of these seven persons, there were only one woman, which uh, pointed about 14% of representation. For delegation with two diplomats, the average proportion of women was 23%, while the average proportion for delegation with four or more diplomats was 33%. So just this uh, stark number shows us how that the women, the representation of women are still uh, so much underrepresented in uh, forums which deals with issues of nuclear disarmament negotiations and how there is a need uh, to focus more on uh, representation. Uh, we have two minutes about gender, left, not... Abhishek. We have two minutes left. Okay. Uh, talking about gender in non-traditional spaces. So traditionally the gender, uh, a new nuclear disarmament process has been influenced by masculinism, shaping in for form of militarism and other flexible forms. But uh, be it about ideology or post-colonial mindset, gender here is seen more about as abstract concept and normative rules. So when we talk about uh, may, uh, focusing on gender norms, what is also important to focus on the diffusion of norms and how norm diffusion helps in mainstreaming feminist normative values and the convergence of different normative values which resonates with every actor engaging a different level of level at which disarmament negotiation takes place. Norm diffusion here also challenges the same for its masculine notions of militarism by possessing nuclear weapons and challenging the different theory. But what makes it more important that norm diffusion helps in influencing, labeling and challenging policies and treaties as fair, just, good, and so forth. Gender here also uh, brings out the aspect of diversity and inclusiveness. And uh, we see that the non-nuclear uh, weapon ban treaty or the treaty of NPT, uh, TPNW is more gender sensitive than the NPT or the nuclear policy. And uh, the preamble of NP, uh, TPNW acknowledges the humanitarian gender respect of nuclear weapons. And we, uh, we have seen that how non-traditional spaces like uh, ICANN have, have worked very closely with uh, states to kind of mainstream this perspective and bridge the theory and praxis uh, which is very important uh, for nuclear summer negotiations. Uh, some trends which uh, uh, we have seen is, uh, is that states, some trends which I've seen uh, from uh, the researchers, states have given priority to men in forums. Uh, so this shows that traditionally the uh, space uh, for diplomacy has been reserved for men and women are not allowed to participate. And uh, when they, the state have a chance of uh, giving a single representative, the almost chances uh, for selection is of men. Women are typically included as the second or more often the third or the fourth member of the delegation. And the nature, the second part is the uh, state gives most priority to women only in forums to humanitarian disarmament. As I also uh, uh, told earlier that the first committee uh, recently achieved a level of 30% women delegation, uh, a mark surprised by, surpassed by the third committee uh, decades before in 1985. And the nature of the committee decides the proportion of gender representation. So it depends upon which uh, committee it is, the state uh, decides who it should send to represent uh, the topic. And more gendered voices are raising in not spaces as compared to traditional spaces. Uh, as I talked about that, um, uh, social movements, civil society, women's peace activism has been working closely with non nuclear states to kind of- The time is up, Abhishek. We have to wind up now. Uh, okay, sure. And as, for, as, I, as I said, the focus, the success has been ICANN and ICPL, which have uh, great, which have also received nuclear, uh, also received Nobel Prize for their activism and work uh, to kind of mainstream treaty. And uh, as I found that there, there are some limitations which are seen as uh, a representation, as I said, power the representation only way uh, without an agency uh, is seen uh, as feminist foreign policy has also uh, seen a little bit of failure, uh, especially in case of Canada, uh, which is also uh, not signed TPNW or also NATO states. And civil society and uh, social movements uh, are becoming more inclusive, but they need to uh, need to go away forward uh, with this also. And I just like just concluding, uh, why locating gender? Be, try and be really important. quick, Abhishek. Be quick. Yes, sure, sure. Uh, locating gender here become, brings out the association uh, between nuclear weapons, possession, and understanding how powerful masculinity is getting on the way of disarmament. 
diplomacy and corporate security. But in addition, locating also helped discover and put things in exact position. And here it is what context, contextualizing gender and nuclear disarmament negotiations to locate and analyze, assist in understanding the nuclear disarmament process and rectify it by mainstreaming gender restrictive masculinity current boundaries through inclusivity, diversity norms, diplomacy, and feminist politics. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Our next speaker now is going to be Ramesh. Thank you, Dr. Leveringos. Um, let me just uh, share my screen. Give me a minute. Can you see my screen? Yes, I can. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you, Dr. Shamai and Dr. Leveringos for giving me the opportunity to present today. Um, I'm actually a, an MA candidate at the Norman Patterson School at Carleton University in Ottawa. So it's pretty early in the morning today, but uh, I'm really glad to be joining you guys uh, for this, uh, um, for the conference. Um, so um, my topic actually is uh, on uh, the um, US uh, SEND initiative, uh, which is uh, creating an environment for nuclear disarmament, which is a new initiative that the United States launched in 2019. And uh, this is a, a paper that I'm kind of at a very early stage of trying to kind of work on. And uh, uh, so I'm just trying to present some basic, some fundamental ideas uh, from this paper. And I would really like to hear from you about, uh, you know, how I can kind of proceed with this. Um, um, so this uh, is an initiative that was launched in 2019, and it was actually kind of positioned as a dialogue um, amongst uh, all of the different uh, participants in the nuclear debate, um, both nuclear weapon states, uh, non-nuclear weapon states, uh, states that are not nuclear processors, that are not part of the NPT, and uh, you know uh, the um, you know the international community in general. Um, so the uh, I'm just going to talk a little bit about um, what's the state of nuclear disarmament today and uh, um, talk a little bit about SEND. Um, and, uh, you know, because this has been a kind of a diplomatic initiative, I'm just going to kind of lay out a little bit of a timeline. Um, what are the main objectives that the SEND has uh, uh, essentially the United States has communicated to the world? And then, um, um, particularly in, in the context of uh, the uh, REFCON that's due to be convened in January of 2022, where does um, SEND kind of fit into that? And what is the future of nuclear disarmament in general with this new initiative? So that's kind of the general um, kind of a layout of this presentation. Um, so um, in terms of um, different approaches to nuclear disarmament, um, we have um, you know, several initiatives that have been essentially kind of uh, been approached by different states at different times. Um, and uh, I've kind of laid out the broad uh, kind of divisions in these approaches. Um, there are several other initiatives that have been also launched over the years, but these are kind of the, the main ones um, that are currently um, being kind of followed by different uh, players, depending on where they come from and who they are. Um, of course, the most um, common thing that you would hear in the disarmament discourse um, and in, in, in disarmament literature is the step-by-step -step approach to nuclear disarmament, which is kind of this notion that uh, the way you go about disarmament is to take initial steps towards certain initiatives, which would then lead to other goals, and then that you would gradually kind of move towards achieving nuclear disarmament. And here you start with uh, essentially the CTBT, um, you know, signing and ratification, because still there are quite a few states that haven't really ratified the treaty as yet, um, and then kind of move into FMCT and so on. So and, can, and then kind of go into verification disarmament and eventually kind of total disarmament. So that's kind of the general kind of mainstream approach to disarmament that you know, particularly the nuclear armed states have been um, have been kind of following, and quite a few of, um, and in fact, all of the um, nuclear allies of the uh, sorry, non-nuclear allies of the nuclear weapon states uh, who come under the nuclear umbrella, um, you know, NATO in particular, and uh, some of the other U.S. allies also kind of follow this particular approach. Um, the second approach is the Global Zero Initiative, which is not so much a kind of an approach, but it's more like a civil society initiative run by policymakers, ex, uh, you know, officials um, in government, 
um, just launched in 2008, I believe, in Paris. And that is an initiative that's kind of uh, more a kind of a civil society initiative. Um, the third approach is the humanitarian approach, which is the fundamental driver behind the uh, TPNW um, and the uh, and that approach, of course, as we know, that's there's quite a bit of literature that's now been published on this, um, where uh, um, about uh, I think uh, 86 states have uh, signed this treaty and about 56 states have actually ratified the treaty. Um, so the humanitarian approach came about because um, many of these states were frustrated with the lack of progress on the part of the nuclear weapon states to fulfill their disarmament obligations under Article 6 of the NPT, and the failure of the 2015 uh, NPT Review Conference to arrive at any kind of a consensus on the way forward. Um, so I think uh, 122 non-nuclear weapon states uh, you know, adopted the uh, treaty, the ban treaty in September 2017. And, uh, and, and I think uh, uh, essentially 50 states were supposed to be um, supposed to sign to actually ratify it, and we seem to have hit that number already. So, so that treaty is already in, um, and uh, um, so the ban treaty essentially kind of prohibits the the development, testing, production, stockpiling, um, transfer, use, and threat of nuclear weapons, um, as well as um, uh, to provide any assistance um, or encouragement to anything that's prohibited. Um, so for nuclear armed states, the treaty provides um, you know, an opportunity to either destroy and join the treaty or join and then destroy their weapons and uh, stipulates a kind of a time-bound framework for negotiations uh, leading to verifiable and irreversible elimination of uh, nuclear weapons. So that's essentially kind of a nutshell what the TPNW uh, is, is, uh, seeks to achieve. Then of course, there's the Stepping Stones Initiative, which is kind of an initiative that's led by uh, Sweden. And uh, this is essentially, um, uh, you know, a Swedish initiative to kind of, um, you know, look at nuclear disarmament. Um, and then we have the IPNDV, which is the, um, which is essentially focused more on verification um, and putting together a verification regime. And then of course, the last of that is the one that I'm kind of going to be talking about today, which is the SEND initiative. Um, now the SEND initiative, I call it an approach, um, but um, that's still kind of, I think a debatable thing because, you know, the SEND is essentially being positioned as a dialogue um, so we are not so sure whether the United States has essentially abandoned uh, the step-by-step -step approach that it has been kind of following and most of its allies have essentially been following over the last so many uh, decades. Or is this um, a dialogue which will essentially end in 2023, which is when the final report on the SEND is supposed to be uh, published? And what happens after that? Um, we are not so sure about this. Or is this a fundamental departure um, in the U.S. approach to nuclear disarmament. In other words, are we kind of backtracking and we are going back uh, in terms of uh, backsliding in terms of our efforts to you know, bring about nuclear disarmament? So um, the kind of the, um, the paper kind of asks several questions. So I'm, I'm kind of in a very early stage of this paper trying to kind of figure out as to how this is going to be structured and I'm going to work on it. So. The main question I'm asking is, is creating the SEND initiative a radical departure in US approach to nuclear disarmament? Um, and is it a fundamental shift in strategy or is it uh, more as a dialogue, um, you know, given the security conditions in the world today? And uh, what are the goals that the United States seeks to achieve with this uh, approach? And, uh, and, you know, what progress has been made? Uh, what are the prospects for success and what are the, what are the impediments? And um, the more important question that I'm also trying to be, that I'm going to look into to answer is that how are the US allies actually responding to this initiative? And how are the other non-nuclear weapon states responding to it? Um, how are China and Russia you know, responding to the initiative and so on? So, and what are the implications um, for arms control and the future of nuclear disarmament as a result of this? Um, so that those are kind of some of the research questions I'm trying to kind of address in this paper. Um, so the, the SEND initiative, as I said, is a, is a working group. Um, to foster dialogue among states on nuclear disarmament. And it's uh, essentially uh, built on this notion um, that, uh, um, that, that the current uh, disarmament initiatives and the processes have essentially kind of uh, um, stalled um, to some extent. In other words, progress on those initiatives have stalled to a large, to a large degree. And that's at least what the United States believes. And also because of the fact that there are fundamental changes 
to global security that are, that are, that are unfolding, uh, which means that um, you know, old ways of looking at disarmament are not working and we have to fundamentally change our approach to how we kind of address our disarmament moving forward. Um, and uh, so the, the foundational idea is that, um, you know, it's, it's about to recast the debate. In other words, um, it's almost like a kind of a, a reaction to the TPNW um, and to see, you know, and to kind of more in favor of, um, you know, how nuclear weapon states approach this problem. Um, so, so, and this has been uh, essentially spearheaded by um, um, uh, Dr. Christopher Ford, who is the U.S. Undersecretary for uh, um, Non-Proliferation and, and uh, International Security. Um, so in the initiative itself, there are about 15 security conditions um, that, um, that are part of a, um, you know, a white paper that was published by the United States, um, which essentially discusses these 15 conditions. I'm not going to go into all of those 15 conditions. Um, there are they are quite um, you know exhaustive and they cover almost a, a plethora of uh, security issues uh, around the world. And uh, um, the main thing that came out of this initiative was that three subgroups were formed, um, led by you know countries like Finland, Netherlands, and the Republic of Korea. And then there were some co-chairs co that have also been part of this initiative. Three person meetings were held, and uh, you know there was a lot of discussion in the media, a um, lot of commentary um, about the first meeting, um, and then slightly less commentary about the second meeting. When my research, that's essentially something that I found, and uh, there was some discussions about uh, virtual meetings in 2021, and of course, I think there are going to be some meetings as part of the NPT Refcon as well, which I'm not uh, entirely sure about, but I've just kind of put it in there. Um, so there have been a series of meetings, um, and uh, the, the dialogue has essentially kind of progressed to a point where um, I think the, 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 main, the initiative is kind of gaining some momentum. Um, and, uh, but what I found interesting was that in the first meeting, there were about 43 states that participated, whereas in the second meeting, that dropped to about 30 states. Um, so I'm not sure how, what, what to make out of it, but, um, but uh, there seems to be... Um, um, you know, kind of a, a little bit of a cooling off period. Also, maybe it's because of the fact that we haven't had any face-to-face -face meetings in a while uh, because of COVID. So the three subgroups are essentially looking at, uh, um, you know, three different areas, uh, which are kind of the main, main objectives of SEND, uh, for the subgroups to actually kind of debate and discuss them. Um, so um, the first subgroup is looking at exploring measures for reduction of um, um, the incentives for states to acquire and increase the stockpiles. The second one looks at uh, is looking at uh, the functions and effectiveness of existing disarmament mechanisms and institutions. So it's looking at the institutional frameworks uh, that are currently in place. And the third subgroup is looking at uh, interim measures to reduce risks, risks related to uh, nuclear weapons. So um, the next steps in the process are essentially you know, this, this, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of looking at, uh, forward to what's going to come out of the NPT RevCon um, uh, and how SEND is going to be uh, perceived in the RevCon and if it is going to play a role in the, in any kind of consensus statement that might or may not emerge out of the RevCon. Um, so there's a two year timetable that was taken up by the subgroups. And uh, uh, I think what's been announced is that there's going to be a final report of the subgroups to be published in 2023, which will kind of um, complete this uh, phase of this dialogue process. Now, what comes after that and how the United States is going to lead this initiative going forward, uh, it remains to be seen. Uh, and it's also noteworthy that in 20, 2015, the last RevCon, we did not have a consensus statement. And I think prior to that, I think in 20, 2005 as well, I think we didn't have one. So, so that's going to be interesting to see as to whether, you know, the different parties can actually arrive at some kind of a consensus in 2022. So um, in terms of the, uh, the future of this initiative and what's going to come out of it, um, essentially what's happened is that um, what we are finding right now is that there are more, um, the, the NPT is getting more frayed. In other words, it's uh, clearly under a lot of pressure. Um, typically, um, we've now seen a clear division um, because all of the states, the, you essentially had the um, P5 and then the non-nuclear weapon states who are all pretty much in agreement about the NPT, you know, until 2017 or so. 
Uh, you have two minutes now, left, Ramesh, you have two minutes. Okay. Uh, so now we have the anti-NPD states, um, so which are essentially the states that have signed and ratified the TPNW. Then we have the non-TPNW uh, and non-nuclear weapon states who have not still signed or ratified them. Um, then we have the P5 NPD states and the, um, the states that are allied with the P5 um, who are currently um, in a separate grouping um, of, of states that are that are looking at this problem fundamentally very different uh, differently from before, but there's a lot of pressure that's coming on NATO states uh, who are aligned with the United States uh, because of the TPNW, uh, particularly states like Canada, for example, are coming under a lot of pressure. And then you have the non-NPT nuclear processors, um, India, Pakistan, uh, Israel, who are also kind of um, you know are, are participating in the SEND initiative, but we're not sure as to you know where they really stand on it. Um, so uh, that's one part of it. Um, so the way I think this particular initiative is being pursued is that um, one view is that it's a very cynical view is that, you know, essentially the United States has discarded um, all the previous um, NPT RevCon uh, um, consensus statements from 2000, 2010, uh, and essentially is following a fundamentally different approach. In other words, there is, um, we are seeing a, a, a fundamental shift in um, the US strategy towards disarmament. Um, the second view is slightly less cynical, um, and it's about the fact that the U.S. is essentially trying to bring the the existing security conditions in the world today into the into a debate format. So, in other words, states actually get to discuss the problems that they've been kind of putting away, and this actually gets a lot of attention uh, within these forums and from these subgroups. And the third um, kind of more empathetic view is to say that uh, the U.S. wants to make real progress. Um, they are making some, you know, some fundamental, um, you know, they're taking steps to in order to kind of move the uh, disarmament discussion um, and also to kind of, um, I think, give it some additional, um, you know, oxygen in a sense, um, so that, um, you know, the, the parties can essentially all come together and figure out as to, you know, what the next steps are and how to move forward. So with that, uh, let me conclude and uh, thank you very much for uh, for giving me this opportunity again. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much, Ramesh. Um, I thought all those um, talks actually worked, you know, fairly well together. I thought uh, Abhishek's um, um, discussion around, sorry, there's a lot of noise in the background probably, Abhishek's uh, discussion around gender and um, and feminist perspectives uh, worked well with the first paper, and, and I thought you had some interesting empirical content um, there as well. And, and Ramesh, I think you're asking a very important question in the run up to, of course, Biden's, um, President Biden's uh, nuclear posture review, right? And, and where send um, figures um, in that. Um, I, have a I have my own questions, but I'm going to open, open it to the floor um, um, to see if there are any any hands? I think there is already one hand, um, Jolene. So, Jolene, would you like to go ahead and ask your question? Yes, yeah, sure. Um, so, firstly, for Carolina, um, I think it's a it's a great topic that that you're addressing. When Tom Sauer and I um, proposed our argument on ditching the NPT, we got a flag from the arms control community and we <laughs> were very surprised about that and they were saying well um the npt is the only leverage legal leverage that states have on non on nuclear weapons say um to disarm and you have to really kind of dismantle the whole idea of disarmament in the npt to to move the process forward that's at least our view so very interesting um in interested in what you're doing and then for um, Abhishek, um, your numbers on representation, I think what I missed in your paper is actually to see how that works. How, how does representation, um, it, it's not an automatic because you, you can have female representation in these committees, but the state's positions are already formed and they just go and present these and if they talk um, if they say something else in these committees and negotiate something else that's not the state position, it really, it, you know, they get fired or they get called back. So the representation, in my opinion, doesn't um, automatically translate into 
um, more of a gender um, focused discussion. And then um, on the CND, um, well, the South African position on this, especially when it was first circulated, the document, um, it was called something along the lines of creating the conditions for nuclear disarmament. And the South African diplomat said, you better take conditions out of that label because it's not going to go down because nuclear disarmament is not conditional. Okay, the NPT said, says it, negotiations must happen. It's not conditional. So um, they listened to that, they took it out of the name, but um, because of this resistance South, that South Africa showed, um, the country was not invited to CNND as I understand it from my sources. So we're not participating in this initiative. Initially, I thought it was because the country didn't want to, but then afterwards I heard we were just not, South Africa wasn't invited to the meeting. So I think that's very interesting. And this diplomat that I spoke to famously said of CNND, if you dress up the cat to look like a puppy dog, don't think that the mouse won't notice. <laughs> I think that's something that you can also work into your paper. Thanks so much. Uh I didn't know this either, Jolene, so it's fascinating. Um, thank you. Paul, would you like to ask your question or questions as well? Well, it, one, one is an observation on the last uh, presentation. I, I, I don't know what, I've been watching C and D uh, develop. I've, I tried to cross question Christopher Ford uh, when he was in London. Um, the Americans aren't giving anything away. I And since they're not preparing the ground and, and, and there's a new administration, so it, it will have different attitudes than the one that launched the initiative. So whatever it is they're going to unfurl, um, it's it, it it's not going to be able to count on any cultivated opinion. Um, and and I, I therefore would be skeptical that it's going to be a could be a, a huge inflection in in um, American policy simply because they haven't prepared the ground. Um, uh, they can't prepare the ground without things leaking. So whatever is being said in in these um, restricted sessions with diplomats is, is so unsensational, it hasn't come out. And that that's, I think, all you can conclude from, from there. Um, um, but my other one uh, point is, is a general one, and it will crop up in my own talk, if anybody stays for that, um, which is that... Um, I, I'm, I'm struck by such a difference in the language. Um, nuclear decisions are taken by nuclear governments, mostly men, yes, um, and no surprise there, uh, in, in secret conclave on the basis of intelligence assessments and nuclear strike plans. Um, how will discussions of post-feminist post-structuralist feminist theory, and many of the other phrases that crop up here, how would you expect them to translate across? How, how, how could the ideas in those languages get um, taken up by the very brutally different discourses uh, that are actually the way that nuclear decision makers talk, although perhaps not when they disguise it in the disarmament archipelago? Uh, so I'm, I'm there's a genuine question of um, Compre mutual comprehensibility and relevance, given the way that the discourse in different areas is, is developing. Can that be bridged or don't you care? Okay, thanks, Paul. Um, I I'm gonna add on a question to that because I had a very similar question um, that was um, per perhaps more oriented to the first two papers. Um, but I, in particular, I was taken, Carolina, with your use of um, Kimberly Hutchins <clears throat> and Major Cetris's work because I know they work well um, and I also know the wider work on the laws of war ethics because of the nature of my husband's own expertise and I was just a bit struck about I mean some of the arguments for instance um, Zephyrus is making I mean that's made in non-feminist circles right I mean if you look at um, you know work on humanitarian intervention you look at work by Janina Dill for instance at Oxford she's not working in the feminist phase she's working on the constructivist vein if you look at, um, you know, Cecile Fabos, for instance, um, as well. So I just wondered, what's the, um, yeah, what's the, the, the I think I can, I can see it more in the Hutchins case, um, um, but, you know, issues around intentionality and issues around 
um, <clears throat> uh, civilians um, and so forth. These are these are things that are you know have been hotly debated for, for way for, 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 for decades in you know just war theory and in you know so I'm just I just I guess what I'm asking is is, is a somewhat similar question about um, could you elaborate more on the the feminist um, aspect here? I can see that perhaps in the Kimberly Hutchins case, but I mean it's just more of a I, I guess more of a you only have you know short time to talk about it, so um, it's more of a sort of um, sense of the feminist angle here, and 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 and, and next to that you know of course there's also a lot of non-feminist discussion around responsibility. I mean you can go back as far as Hedley Ball and his you know work on the great irresponsible. So I, I wondered where you think that interacts with and how does it interact with the feminist discourses that you want to bring in? So thanks very much. And I should say, um, shall we go in the order of um, uh, Ramesh first um, and the questions around um, CND um, and then um, uh, Abhishek and Carolina? Um, yeah, thanks, uh, Paul, for that question. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, that's still, uh, as I said, like, um, it's uh, essentially being positioned as a dialogue right now. So we are not sure as to whether this is a fundamental departure in strategy, um, in the US nuclear disarmament strategy. Um, I think it, we also need to look at it in the context of what's going on with regard to arms control treaties and uh, the fact that there's rearmament happening right now uh, with China, Russia. So you have um, a, an environment in which uh, the United States is pushing for this kind of a dialogue, because I think you need to look at the larger geopolitical context of where this is um, headed and what's happening around the world right now um, in terms of uh, uh, nuclear weapons, uh, missiles, uh, new missile technologies, hypersonics. So I think, um, and and you know, one of the big uh, issues that was discussed was. Um, you know, in the whether uh, the United States should discuss uh, ballistic missile defense in any new future arms control treaties with, with China or with Russia, uh, which is a new topic that's come into arms control because uh, BMD was typically kind of kept out of it uh, for very many years. It was essentially when we talked of arms control, we always discussed uh, nuclear weapons and missiles. We never really talked about BMD. Uh, but apart from BMD, you have hypersonic missiles as well now, which are coming into the equation. So. Um, so that's kind of gives me pause to think about whether this could mean something more fundamental than we are kind of, uh, you know, when we look at the, the optics of it from the, um, in terms of what's going on, it looks like it's just a dialogue and we'll see a report at the end of this in 2023, but um, I'm, I'm skeptical about whether this is just that or it's something that's much more fundamental that's unfolding, which might kind of, um, it's not something that the Trump administration was pushing through, but something that uh, you know the Biden administration might continue with this um, because uh, Chris Ford still is in office. He's still kind of there. Um, and, uh, and the most interesting thing for me, at least to look out for is what comes out of the nuclear posture review that the Biden administration is, is working on right now. So that will kind of give us some indication of where this might be headed in future. Okay, thanks, Ramesh. Um, Abhishek, would, would you like to address any of the questions? Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, to address uh, uh, Jorian's questions, like uh, she talked about how representations uh, work. So in my paper, I have first tried to uh, identify where does gender figure out in the Negro Summer negotiations. So as I, as I gave an example of uh, representation doesn't, as, as she correctly pointed out, that the state's positions is fixed. So representation, uh, or increasing the representation uh, affects very less. But what it also, uh, con what representation also contributes to these the kind of treaties which are form which are formulated, what kind of language it is used. So when women diplomats are represented, uh, it is seen that women, uh, that the kind of language and the treaties are more sustainable in nature. As I gave example of JCPO that was negotiated by women, uh, it was very sustainable, but due to the geopolitics and the kind of uh, when state national interests uh, are kind of uh, kind of uh, uh, portrayed in a certain manner, those kind of uh, treaties becomes very much uh, challenging in that sense. So representation works with a, uh, with kind of uh, mainstreaming certain norms uh, and uh, and feminist foreign policy that helps helps in that way. But representation uh, is also working is to give women the representation. It's also about 
the women narratives to be kind of mainstream and as i said before that the uh, right now the we have seen that the non traditional spaces such as civil society are working very much in close coordination with uh, states which are which are which are non nuclear weapon states and when, uh, and those nuclear non nuclear weapon states try to mainstream those narratives when they, when we go into negotiations so and through them representation is how it kind of influences the broader effect of negotiations on nuclear disarmament um and to uh, the question of uh, paul uh, i think feminist uh, as as he mentioned that the the broader geopolitical context uh, kind of in how do feminist narrative fare, figure out into that uh, i think like the main thing is the feminist kind of challenges the narrative that uh, we have uh, there has been long tradition of uh, the feminist challenging the deterrence theory that has it worked out or not and the kind of the latest deal on occurs has has again reiterated this kind of uh, uh, legacy of fem feminist activism and also that uh, these kind of uh, narratives about kind of uh, con confrontation or kind of uh, annihilation is against the uh, way that uh, the npt kind of thought about about kind of article 6 which talk about it uh, uh, nuclear disarmament uh, fully so feminist kind of challenges that notions of uh, of that language and that is how they kind of mainstream this idea of nuclear disarmament Okay, thanks, Abhishek. Um, Carolina. No, thank you very much for that comment. Uh, I can't hear you very well, Carolina. Sorry. Um, sorry. I think you just need to lean into the mic like you did last time. I think it might be quite sensitive. See how it is if you just talk close to the mic. Is it working? No, it's still quite quiet. Hmm. Is it better now? Yeah, it's much, yeah, much better. better. Thanks. Okay. Yeah, maybe I don't know what's going on with this computer today. Anyways, um, I just want to say thank you everyone for comments and questions, and uh, particularly Jolene for your comments. And I completely agree. I think things out there are quite normalized so um i think we need to pause and reflect on whether um you know things made to help us are actually doing their job or not um, um on uh nicholas question um so I, uh, in terms of uh, zephyrs's work i think i just want to say that i think it's particularly interesting how it connects to to kimberly hutchings in a way that they talk about international law and putting the conditions in place uh, for, for, for things to, to be accepted. I think that's particularly interesting in how like they, they um, connect to each other in terms of arguments. Um, even though Zaif is, uh, does not address uh, things from a very feminist perspective, uh, I would say that they, a lot of the work is kind of grounded in that feminist anti-war tradition. And, and, and that's how I try to, to frame the paper. So in the very beginning, I talk about the feminist anti-war tradition and, and how I'm, I'm asking the question on why nuclear weapons are so persistent from, from, from that perspective. Um, and that's how I kind of decided to use both of them because I think it connects really well with the feminist anti-war tradition. Um, so in terms of feminism, I would say that um, the way I'm trying to frame this is that um, disarmament is connected with kind of gendered meanings. And, and, and in that time, I mean, um, like meanings there are more connected to feminine characteristics, peace, nonviolence, as opposed to the more dominant discourse, as Paul was addressing before, of uh, the strategic language, um, the um, uh, talking about security, talking about deterrence and so on. So that's how I'm trying to think about disarmament in terms of gender there. Um, and I think that's how it connects to, to, to feminism, if that answers your question. Yeah, it does. Thanks, Colleen. I think also I was, I was, I guess I wanted to ask something um, slightly different as well, which was about the relationship between 
um, some of the things you're interested in around, um, you know, the law and ethics and some of the dynamics that you bring out, right? How the law actually is quite permissive, right? Um, um, of, of, of things that maybe ethics wouldn't be, right? Um, um, that those things can be brought out in other sort of theoretical frameworks, right? And have been. Um, and so I, I thought it might be interesting to, um, to look at the interaction between these feminist arguments and non-feminist arguments elsewhere that are making somewhat similar, I think, argue, you know, points about um, the law and, and, and ethics when it comes to, to, to nuclear matters. But I also thought that your, your bigger point at the beginning about the MPT and how the disarmament principle is, is in, in effect um, uh, actually um, not helping itself, right? Um, I thought that was a really powerful um, um, argument. Um, so I, I thought the sort of the broader overarching arc of your paper was very, very important. Um, I have a, another question, not for Carolina. Could, could I just for, ask? For, oh, sorry, Paul. Yeah, I don't yeah. think my question was answered. Let, let okay, me rephrase okay, this. Sorry. Um, yes. it's, it, it seems to me very unlikely that, that work done in this tradition with this language is going to influence those uh, male strategically minded decision makers who will determine the nuclear future. Um, maybe you don't think that's true, maybe you think it will influence them, but if it doesn't influence them, does it matter to you? Are, are you happy just to, to, to spend years working in this vein, even if it has a high likelihood of not affecting the way that decisions are taken in the nuclear world? I mean, I'm genuinely humanly curious. Um, I don't I don't think I actually haven't really thought about it because maybe it's not part of how I think politics and international relations, which is quite interesting to to pause and reflect on. So I, I don't I don't think I have an answer to that particular question. Um, for me, the analysis is really important. The way I understand um, international relations, as you know not being just about strategy, not being just about deterrence and being about other things as well, and caring about how bringing gendered perspectives and being, bringing that post-structuralist analysis into the conversation um, kind of reviews uh, hidden stories, stories that we haven't really um, looked at. And, you know, that those stories are really important to, to influence change and to influ influence future policy. So I think that's a, what I would say. I don't, I don't know if it answers your question uh, in particular, but yeah, that's what I would say about that. Okay, I'm, I'm just fascinated because it's how you are spending your life. Um, and, and, and then you say, I haven't really thought about it, you know, the significance of this. And that, that, that's fascinating. I'll take away that, the memory of you saying that. That's just, it's just, it, it, it helps improve my understanding of, of um, how academics work and how, how thinking is conducted, how campaigns happen. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I guess as a broader point, so, I mean, not all academics work, um, work is intended uh, to transform the world and uh, transform the policy world necessarily, right? Um, I mean, it might be uh, analysis in and of itself, right? Um, but, but I think you know, as I said earlier about Carolina's um, broader point, I think her point is very, that has policy relevance, right? I mean, I think the argument you're making, Carolina, about the disarmament principle within the MPT has a very strong policy relevance. So, um, you know, maybe the theoretical framework and applying those, as I understand it, has academic and theoretical value in and of itself. Forget, you know, policy and everything else. I think the broad argument make does have a very strong um, policy policy relevance in my view. I think it's a very powerful statement. Okay, um, I'm waiting for other hands. Um, I see Jolene's hands. Jo Jolene, would you like to come in on this? So just on this point, on Paul's point. Um, I mean, Ray Atchison wrote that book on um, banning the bomb, smashing the patriarchy. So, I mean, I. I recommend that you read that to look at the impact, even if it's the TPNW, but the impact that feminist voices and <clears throat> changing the discourse can have. Thanks, Jolene. Um, your, I think that is your hand. Um, okay, I have also a question that I wanted to ask. Um, and Carolina, if you want to come back later to that, please, please do. 
I have a question to ask of Ramesh about the CND. Um, and I, I think it's a little bit unfair because it's sort of gazing into the future because we don't know how the CND will look like, uh, you know, this time next year. But, but um, it, it, and I didn't know what Jolene mentioned about the South African, um, uh, you know, relationship to the CND and, and, and or the lack of representation there and not being invited. Um, but it's very much a diplomatic outfit, right, uh, CND. It's very much about reaching out, as I understood it from people like Heather Williams and who's been involved, it was about reaching out to sort of allies, non-MPT non members, that was a key part of it, right? It, but it, it wasn't able to sort of reach out to China and, and some other tricky, um, trickier ones. Um, but, but my question is, 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 is not, not necessarily about state representation, um, it's more about the people themselves who are involved. So, um, as I understand it, most of them have been diplomats, and and um, in a way, it just seems like another forum uh, with the same people, um, you know, that that discuss the MPT and 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 you know the runs up run up to those. Um, and and I wonder if the CND has space to be more than just a diplomatic outfit, and what you think about that, and who would. Who could you bring in uh, who would be willing to be brought in to make it something more transformative, given that your question is about whether it's a radical change or departure? That's my question. Yeah, I think so, uh, one yeah. of the main uh, criticisms of the CND has been the fact that uh, it's essentially a state led uh, kind of initiative uh, involving other states and state actors, uh, officials, policymakers. And it doesn't involve any uh, civil society or any of the other members. So that's, um, I think, been one of the main criticisms. Um, uh, I'm not so sure if that's going to fundamentally change because I think the United States wants to very closely control this process. Uh, what I'm seeing, at least, they want to set the agenda. Uh, they want to kind of, um, you know, control as to who's actually in these meetings um, and uh, how these discussions are held and and what the format is. And, and so, so they want to kind of move this in a direction that's kind of has, has a lot of kind of preset ideas about. So, um, so I'm not so sure as to whether they are going to kind of expand the, uh, the tent, if you will, to bring in more people um, into the tent to kind of you know, engage in these discussions and dialogue. Um, and also because of the fact it's so security focused uh, because if you look at those 15 conditions or the 15 different issues that they are like, you know, they want to kind of discuss um, in these meetings, um, it ranges from anything and everything that you want to kind of, you look at the, the there's a panoply of issues out there all the way from North Korea's, um, you know, uh, to disarm North Korea of nuclear weapons to Iran, uh, to regional security issues, South Asia, South, you know, uh, East Asia, um, the Middle East. Uh, and the uh, the Middle East weapon free zone. So this this almost everything has been kind of thrown into it, and a lot of it is all 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 security focused. So so that's I think um, one of the problems with this uh, this approach. The, and the question is, um, can they kind of move this forward? And what happens after 2023? So we're not uh, you know when, when this report is finally published, does it does it end with that and we kind of move on move back, or is this a fundamental change in the discourse and the and, and the and, and uh, that the United States is trying to kind of push uh, forward. So that's the uh, question that I'm hoping to kind of answer in this paper. And I'm going to look at um, fundamentally how other people, other countries are responding to this initiative, particularly um, you know, um, countries that are um, uh, the, uh, the non-nuclear weapon states that are US allies, uh, because they are the ones who are now in a, in a very difficult uh, situation. Okay, thanks, thanks, Ramesh. Carolina, did you want to come in or shall I go to the next question? Um, you mean uh, in terms of responding to, to what question? Sorry, I think I missed. There wasn't really, was I mean, yeah, there really wasn't much. It was, Jolene um, um, mentioned um, a particular book um that um, oh true that, true that's yeah. true uh yeah i definitely agree it's a very important contribution um and we can't say that there isn't change happening mm. if the whole humanitarian initiative is grounded in this 
you know, uh, feminist anti-war tradition with the change in discourse and uh, all of everything that we have seen in the past a uh, couple of years with the emergence of the TPNW. So um, I believe that that's, that's proved that change is possible. And by bringing different perspectives, we're able to uh, grasp and seize uh, possibilities for change. So, yeah. Thanks. Thanks, Carolina. Okay, I've got a hand. Um, Shov, um, I think that's you. Yes, that's me. Uh, thanks. Um, three comments, really. First, to uh, Ramesh, uh, thanks for the presentation. Uh, really good. And I agreed with, with um, or I, I recognize all the different um, initiatives that you identified, but I, I, I wonder if the um, one way of classifying all those different initiatives or the, the fundamental distinction there is one, in my view, between stigmatization and non-stigmatization, right? It's, it's whether you want to pursue disarmament uh, through uh, stigmatizing nuclear weapons and creating political will, or whether you want to pursue disarmament uh, whilst still sort of pending the completion of disarmament, see a legitimate role for the potential use of nuclear weapons in certain circumstances, right? So that's, that, that's how I kind of see it, because in a way, it seems to me strange to contrast the humanitarian initiative and ban treaty approach on the one hand with the step-by-step -step approach on the other, because I think very few, if any, supporters of the, the humanitarian initiative and and, and TPNW would object to the step-by-step -step approach if it did actually happen, you know? It's, uh, I think, for many of those who support the TPNW and, and humanitarian initiatives, the, the entire idea is to give fuel to the step-by-step -step approach or, or, or just any approach, right? Because the, 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 the idea is that in the absence of a more sort of permissive normative environment for nuclear disarmament, then, then it's probably not going to happen whether through a step-by-step -step approach or any approach, right? Uh, so that's that's the first comment. And then second, just a literature tip for um, Carolina. I, think, I, I suppose you have probably enough theory already, but just uh, nevertheless, um, just a tip. Samuel Moyne has a recent book on how, in his view, the development of the laws of war uh, enabled the forever war in the United States. So um, that sounds like it dovetails uh, quite nicely with some of the arguments that that you're making. And then finally, just a just a quick comment on I, I think Paul's very important question about how discourses travel and the potential uptake of discourses in 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 sort of the structures of powers that uh, that exist. Uh, and I think the entire question there, which is a good one. Uh, rests on a theory of change centered on persuasion, right? The, the underlying idea there is that in order to have policy relevance, we must persuade the people who are in power now. But I think perhaps the, 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 the theory of change that, that at least could be argued to underpin some of the more critical work, which I think Carolina is working within, is that the alternative way of changing the world is, is to, to, to replace people or to change power structures, right? So the idea would be that in order to have, to, to, to have progress on disarmament, uh, the, the intelligence uh, people and strategic studies people within uh, Ministry of, of Defense, often unelected, shouldn't be the people making nuclear policy, but rather other people, perhaps democratically elected leaders or uh, civil society organization, whatever. I, I just wanted to, to highlight that difference in, in how we think about how change might happen. Personally, I think that um, it's not very plausible uh, to, to persuade some of the people who are in power right now of disarmament. You know, the current, uh, as, as, uh, as Lyndon talked about yesterday, uh, three of the five uh, last um, secretaries of defense in the United States have worked for Raytheon, for one of the world's largest nuclear weapons producers. I think sort of uh, persuading them of uh, abolition is probably not going to happen. But what is at least 
more plausible is that someone else, someone from a completely different tradition, would be appointed to a role like that sometime in the future and would bring in a completely different way of thinking. So, yeah, thanks. Thanks, so that was very helpful. Um, any panelists want to come back on, 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 on those? Ra um, Ramesh, did you want to come back first with the comments about uh, CND? Um, yeah, I think uh, that's uh, a point well made. I think about the fact that uh, the humanitarian approach um, is not fundamentally kind of uh, antithetical to uh, you know the step by step as long as there's progress on that. I think that's a, that's something that I would kind of uh, incorporate into my own analysis um, because I didn't think of it that way. So thank you uh, for uh, for that um, for that uh, observation. Carolina Abhishek, would you like to come back on any of those? Um, I just want to uh, thank for uh, the comments. Um, they're very, very useful. And I think um, thinking about change is really important as well. And the theories we have available out there to explain change um, is something that we need to, to look at in order to uh, theorize it theorize about disarmament. Um, and yeah, it's definitely important to look at replacing power structures. I, the way I see uh, power structures working in nuclear politics, not necessarily mean replacing people, but I, I, I think about it as kind of the way we replace ideas. Of course, people and actors are the, the key um, elements and you know in this world of new weapons but i do think ideas are important as well so um perhaps maybe trying to connect uh theories that look at um ideas and theories that look at uh, the role of actors would be a good way to go um yeah just wanted to add that uh, just to add yep yeah. mm -hmm. Carolina's point, uh, I think uh, why, it, why it's necessary to kind of question uh, the current contemporary kind of theories and uh, kind of characteristics associated with the nuclear uh, field uh, is to kind to, is a way to change the way forward we are going. And um, looking at the current developments, it doesn't kind of um, shows any positive signs to the, to the direction future we are looking at. And so that become necessary to kind of challenge those notions and to mainstream those theories, which kind of uh, kind of talk about more peace, sustainable peace, and uh, uh, inclusivity and diversity. Uh, thanks, Abhishek. Lyndon, thank you for putting your hand up because I was going to pick on you. So, Lyndon. Thanks very much. Uh, Nicola, yeah, I mean, uh, fascinating conversation. Thanks all. I've done a lot of writing and thinking around these issues, so I can't resist just weighing in um, on Scholz and his theories of change, on Paul and his question about the theory of change. Um, so, you know, my piece yesterday was around the Hotel California effect, and I, I focused on money in that context. But actually, you can break down the Hotel California effect in lots of ways, money, politics, psychology, beliefs, etc. And on this issue of theories of change, I just want to revisit the psychological belief based aspect of that and how it relates to international law, basically, and the NPT generally and the ban treaty theory of change specifically with its humanitarian approach, including post colonial feminist, etc. perspectives. Um, I guess the core point I'd make is that disarmament and deterrence are fundamentally incompatible. They don't exist in the same universes. Either making nuclear threats enhances security and peace, in which case you don't want to get rid of nuclear weapons, or making nuclear threats does not enhance security and peace, and therefore you do want to get rid of nuclear weapons. Those are mutually incompatible positions, in my personal opinion. Um, I've done a lot of research around this in the NPT context, and actually if you look at the texts of the NPT meetings, speeches, working papers, etc., I believe that they very strongly reinforce that perspective because if you go back through NPT history, every time there's any discussion of 
disarmament or movement in the direction of disarmament, whether it's no first use, ratifying the protocols to nuclear weapon free zones, um, you know, uh, sole purpose, whatever it is, uh, which people on the disarmament side of the ledger who do not support nuclear deterrence would say is a step in the direction of disarmament. Um, in all of the open source literature, what happens is that the, the allies and the nuclear weapon states get up and go, we would love to do that. We would love to adopt no first use. We would love to whatever it is, but we can't. And the reason is because we need to keep making nuclear threats. And so in the open source literature, that's what the official narrative is. Um, and Stepping back from that to the kind of theoretical level, um, I really want to highlight the point that arms control is not disarmament. Arms control is the strategic twin of deterrence. It is not the strategic twin of disarmament. Arms control was created and developed and advocated and adopted in response to the, quote, utopias, the fictional utopias of disarmament. So it was explicitly developed as a means to stabilize deterrence relationships, in other words, to stabilize and maintain nuclear threat making. And so every time that we talk about arms control, uh, unless it is wrapped in a process to explicitly eliminate nuclear weapons, what we're actually doing is we are legitimizing the idea of making nuclear threats. We're legitimizing the idea that we can control nuclear deterrence relationships, that we can stabilize them, and that we can therefore continue to maintain nuclear weapons in perpetuity. Um, so with all of that said, to the extent that the nuclear weapon states use the NPT uh, language as a means to legitimize their practice of making nuclear threats, uh, to me, there is just no, and so this goes to your point, Paul, and also to some of the stuff that Carolina said, it's like, to me, there is no credible, rational, logical pathway in the NPT towards disarmament, as long as we keep making the claim that nuclear weapons ensure security, you know, and we make that claim in terms of guarantees, essential for security, guarantees international peace and security, as long as we keep making that threat, uh, sorry, as long as we keep making that claim publicly, then there's no psychological incentive to get rid of nuclear weapons. Um, there's no economic incentive because there's trillions of dollars to be made making nuclear weapons and making nuclear threats. And because there's trillions of dollars to be made making nuclear weapons and nuclear threats, there's no political incentive because you've got 10,000 people replacing the GBS, uh, you know, the ground-based secured, um, ground-based strategic deterrent missile force in the US. And as a result, there's an insta mob ready to just jump on any senator that suggests reducing any part of the US nuclear arsenal they'll jump on them on Twitter, they'll crucify them uh, on Fox News, and that person will be voted out of office the next two years, you know? So yeah, that's all I have to say on that. Um, I think the theory of change feeds into that, right? Because we're changing the narrative around what security is. And if we change the narrative around what security is through these post-colonial feminist approaches, then we can change our beliefs about whether making nuclear threats of annihilation does actually equate to security and peace. Um, yeah. Thanks very much. Thanks, Lyndon. I uh, I see you have inspired two more hands, and they're going to be the final hands uh, for the panel. Trish and Henrietta, if you could be really quick. I mean, I think we can go into another five minutes. It's not a big deal. And then we'll give the panelists the option to reply or not, um, as it is. So, Trish, do you want to? Mine is just very that? quick. Just to say, I think uh, Lyndon's point about making that distinction between arms control and disarmament is really important and i think often because because that distinction isn't made then there's misunderstandings about what different terms make so my ears always prick up when i hear the word stigma um and um and it occurred to me when i was hearing the discussions that that is one of the biggest problems we face is a misunderstanding about stigma and about what that wording means and that wording is very much associated with the uh, total um, nuclear weapon test ban treaty. It, it, it's always associated with the total ban, but it's misunderstood. It, it's not black and white. It's not, you can't say, well, you accept you nuclear weapons, therefore they're not stigmatized. They are stigmatized, but our understanding of stigma is not black and white. You know, we're human beings. If we're talking about ideas, human beings are complicated. You know, they'll accept something and not accept it at the same time you know so I, I think when we're looking at these puzzles we need to um not be quite so black and white in our thinking uh, and i think making that distinction between disarmament and um, arms control and understanding that they're separate rather than just assuming well they're all about nuclear weapons and they're about 
you know, limitations on nuclear weapons. Therefore, they've got to be the same thing. They're not. One is absolute and one is accepting. And um, I think that that's very helpful in trying to understand the issues and the challenges we face. And it ties in with Carolina's point about we need to understand ideas and the discussions we've been having about um, feminist perspectives, etc. It's about understanding these different ideas and really just sort of moving away from this Cold War dominated thinking that the world is black and white. It's not. Um, and so I just think that those discussions were extremely helpful. Um, and um, there were some really important points raised there. Thank you. Thanks, Trish. Henrietta? Thanks. Um, I'm sorry, I was late. I had another meeting this morning and I'm just, I've, I've missed the talk. So I'm really sorry because they looked and very, they look fascinating. And the conversation that I've been part of that I've heard is, is brilliant. So, I mean, like Patricia, I just want to kind of messy up the picture a little bit. Um, Lyndon, your comment, you know, I, I recognise the picture that you're portraying about the discourses with the MPT kind of present some sort of uh, complete dichotomy between disarmament and the possession of nuclear weapons. Um, but I want to kind of just raise the question, how does one account then for the disarmament that has taken place while the MPT has been um, you, you know, these discourses have served to deliver some disarmament. I know it's not complete disarmament. I know there's there's uh, uh, limitations to it. Um, but it feels to me, not, not just in this context, but in all sorts of contexts, the, the art of policy making is squaring impossible circles. Um, and in theory, there are these hard and fast dichotomies. And then in practice, sometimes, not often, not always, but there, there are chances for wiggle rooms. Uh, so uh, I hope that was even half coherent. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Lyndon, for replying in the in the chat box. It's such a shame we don't have um, a, a coffee session now for you to extend that conversation. I just want to give the, the remaining literally two minutes now to the panelists if you want to reply to that. You don't have to, but if, if you have any comments on, on the last three questions, comments we have. So I'll go in the order. Carolina, would you like to add anything? Um, no, I just want to thank everyone for comments and questions. Uh, discussion, uh, fascinating discussion, really interesting uh, ideas. Um, so I just want to thank everyone. Thank you, Carolina. Um, Abhishek. Uh, no, ma'am, thank you for giving this opportunity. Um, and for the lovely comments and questions, and especially Lyndon for kind of comprehensively explaining like the idea of disarmament and position equilibrium. Wonderful, thank you. And uh, Ramesh. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, it's been a real uh, um, an interesting discussion, and I really enjoyed it. And uh, um, and I also want to kind of uh, thank Lyndon for his article in the. Um, you know, I think the. Uh, uh, was it the uh, Bureau of Atomic Scientists that he wrote an article which I think kind of benefited from um, in discussing SEND as well and uh, thank you for uh, all of your comments. Thank you all of you um, um, for a wonderful panel um, that I think had a very rich discussion. Um, Trish, um, shall we say we come back at, at quarter past still or would you like to extend the break slightly? Or 